And so our minds need to wrap around the politics that is language, the politics that is code. And so, so we hear this thing called code switching that people talk about. Here. Well, we code switch and we speak one way in one situation and speak another way in another situation. Well, that only works in theory, right? It only works in theory. And the reason why it only works in theory because language exists in a similar situation that the, uh, I mean, a similar situation to the games that we play in this room. Languages exist within like a political tug of war, where certain people, in their code switching, the distance isn't as far, and not only is the distance not as far, they get to make the rules of how we we switch codes. For instance, it's okay to say standard English, but if I made up standard English, if I type, uh, coined it, wow, that professor isn't that intelligent. He doesn't know that you can't modify a noun using a noun. And why is it important? Why is it important for us to, you know, you know, to think about what, what code switching really amounts to, right? Because for some of us, when we, when we think about code switching, the code switching isn't over. The code switching is always up away from the language that's spoken at home, away from the chips that we have in our group, right? And toward, you know, aspiring toward the chips that this group deems most valuable. And the groups that, and, and the chip that they deem valuable is going to be the chips that they have the most of. We have the most green chips. So the green chip is going to be valued most. But we got more white chips. And we don't necessarily have access to the green chips, at least not the same kind of access to the green chips. And once we get access to the green chips and you all decide that we have too much access to the green chips, the, the game might change some more and, and then the blue chips become the power chip. And then once this group gets the blue chip, then the blue chip is no longer the power chip, the white chip becomes the power chip. Right? And, and, and that's the game that we play. And, and so, so, so when we aspire up, when we cold switch up, we leave behind and we say something really interesting about the chips that are in our bag. One, that the chips in our, our bag aren't as valuable as the chips that are, that are in this bag, right? Not as valuable. And it also says that we're not as valuable. It says that we're not as valuable. Which is a really interesting, like, psychic moment that happens. It's the first activity we did. Where we change our language and we have to speak in two-syllable words and we begin to feel frustrated. Knowing that we have language and that we can express the things that, you know, people want us to express. We can say the things that, you know, are necessarily to, necessary to be said, but yet we can't, we can't say it that well in two syllables, but we can say it. There are some implications. We, we begin to feel less, less, we feel less about ourselves, less confident in our speaking, less confident in our playing of the game. And then that internalized, you know, like feeling of inferiority subject us to really interesting moments. So in the game we decide to sit down instead of play. Because we know the game is unfair. We know the game is frustrating. We know that the remarks that we get about our language is ultimately condescending. We know that we're doing everything that we can do and that they didn't work as hard, I mean, as hard as we did or harder than we did. This myth of meritocracy. We know that, that that's, not the, that's not the case. And yet we can't quite put our hands on it. That switching doesn't work. That switching only makes us feel badly about ourselves. Because the switching exists within a political arrangement where there are certain groups, people have money, people can you know, make rules, not make rules, systems and institutions that govern have a certain type of authority over the rules and to tell us, you know, what's right and what's wrong. And it's usually not something that we're familiar with. There's another idea called code meshing. Like, let's put all the bags and the chips, you know, the chips together. So let's put it all together. And that amounts to, you know, what I would consider, you know, linguistic schizophrenia. It's like meshing. It's like put it all together. Well, it doesn't help. Because if you're just meshing, that means you just you go into you go into the bag and you get you pull out whatever you can. And we saw if you go into the bag randomly, 
whether it has green chips or white chips in it, there is a chance that you're going to pull out a white chip. There is a chance that you're going to pull out a white chip. Chance you'll pull out a green chip, but there is a chance that you'll pull out a white chip. And that doesn't help. That doesn't give us a type of deliberate um, facility over language and over the situation of language, which is this game, right? The power within the game. That doesn't give us any type of facility over. So, so for me, the question is, how can we empower ourselves by understanding the deep politics behind code? And not code switch, this kind of like condescending approach, you know, a bridging or code mesh, this kind of linguistic schizophrenic approach. How can we code match? I heard Toni Morrison talk once. And she was giving a lecture at Michigan State University, like one of the best lectures I've ever heard. And she began speaking to us in French. Like, wow, she knows French. Toni Morrison speaking, speaking to us in French. It's like sophisticated. Then she went into like this academic language. She started to use words like um, materializing, problematizing, like wow, and other you know, multisyllabic words that were just like beautiful <coughs> and, and nicely woven together. Then she started using ebonics. And we were captivated, right? Because it, 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 it enlivened her stories. And then she used like this magical, realistic, literary language. And it was beautiful because none of us had that poetic imagination. The thing is, she used many different codes. And all of them was right. Every code was right. Her ebonics was right. Her, 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 her use of um, Spanish and French was right. Her standard English was right. It was right because she understood something deeply about the audience and the effect that it would have on us. In her bag, she could pull out a green chip when it was necessary to pull out a green chip. Right? She didn't give away her white chips because she could pull out the white chip when it was necessary to pull out the white chip. She could pull out the red chip when it was necessary to pull out the red chip and the blue chip when it was necessary to pull out the blue chip. She had a facility over it. She could manage the bag. And in being able to manage the bag, she was able to manage situations. She was able to be within all groups. And one thing that she was able to do in doing so was displace the power dynamic inherent to the game. For her, the white chip was as valuable as the green chip. Just as valuable as the blue chip. Just as valuable as the red chip. All the chips had purpose. All the chips had meaning. All the chips had value. And this was a humanizing expression. Because she valued everyone in the room. And she valued the intersection between the us's that occupied her space. Important point. Because we don't always get that. I was doing some research um, in Detroit. One kid wrote this poem. You turn, left behind legs sprawling on top of black back mountains, rivers that run deep like Sheba's queen, and she loves open pores inside empty cups that run over hope like escalades that faint in darkness, that freeze at night, that frickin' morning, Morning uprising, light skinned white men, blues is my brother's, black is my berry, sweet is my juice. So you turn back to me, I return back to you, I die daily for you. And his teacher looked at his poem. It was, it was great that the teacher gave him an assignment to write a poem. I was like, wow, it's not a five paragraph essay. He can express some like deep things here. But she looked at his poem and she circled to you. And she said, lazy. <laughs> and red ink on the side, right? She, she circled to B. And she circled the four. And there was a question, right? There was a question about what would have happened in that moment. Like, she, like carved up his paper in red until it bled. Almost literally with red. It was stained in red. It's poem. Because the U wasn't standard. 